Well, today's the trial run. Um, so um, I guess we should just start with the easy problems. Um, unless anyone wants to preface the entire session with something. I don't think I have anything of that nature. We can just dive right in. Yes. So I think um, Ege, well, sorry if I butchered the pronunciation, volunteered for uh, problem, the easy problem one to number three. So maybe we can start from you, Ege, or do you have any preference? Yeah, okay. Uh, so <laughs> that was a good pronunciation, by the way. <laughs> so if you guys <laughs> wondering how to pronounce my name, it's Ege. Uh, I'm from Turkey, by the way. <laughs> Let me introduce myself first. I'm from Turkey, working as a data scientist. I'm the one and only data scientist in the company, so I'm really excited to meet guys like you because I don't have any friends in the office. So, <laughs> so uh, thank you for being there. And other than that, um, I'm also honored to solve the easiest questions on the book. So let me share my screen real quick. By the way, while you're sharing your screen, are you in Turkey right now? Yes. Nice. What time is it there? No, it's now 10 p.m. All right, late night data science. Cool. Yeah. Um, by the way, I, need, I think I need to restart Zoom because I... I gave permission to Mac. My Mac, as Ken said, you know, there are problems. <laughs> Let me rejoin real quick. All right. Yeah, I've seen that issue. If you, the first time with the Mac, you have to sign on it and uh, it's a security thing and then you have to restart it. So that's, that makes sense. By, by first time, do you mean you don't mean in a call, right? You mean the first time you're using, you're ever sharing your screen? I think it's either sharing a screen or it might be a call. Yeah, yeah. this is my first time sharing my screen on Zoom because I don't use Zoom that much. Uh, so yeah, this is first. All right, all right, it, the floor is yours now. Yeah, all right. So since those questions are easy, uh, like I could spend like, um minute or two but i wanted to share my intuition behind the my personal intuition behind the pers given that all conditional probability think so yeah as written as on the written on the book the, this operator the pipe i think is can be it can be read as given that and um this uh this Interpretation, interpre interpretation can be read loud as probability of A given B. So that actually solves a lot of problems from question one to three. And um, on the book, it also explained that um, this equation is really important. And I would like to think the pipe operator as the filter function on the plier or I mean, instead of calculating the probability of A in all of the data set, you take the subset of the data set and then calculate the probability A. So that gets you probability of A given B. So I made a really example data set. Like we have day and weather columns and some days are rainy, some days are sunny. And if you want, if you would calculate the probability of Monday, you would simply um, sum the days that are Monday and divide it by the num number of days. Uh, it, it can be written like short, like written mean, where day is Monday. It's a 40% chance the day is Monday. But if you wanna calculate the conditional probability, 
you can subset the data set where the weather is rain and then calculate the probability probability of Monday on that subset database. And it is also equal to um, joint distribution between A and B divided by the probability of B. And this is the notation for that. And it's in, in here, I actually do that. I take the, I calculate the probability of that is raining. And then I calculate the probability that is raining and the day is Monday. Then I divide it and I get the same result. And from there, there is a mathematical, uh, mathemat mathematical operations. And from there, you can drive the base theorem, which is this. So I think this is enough information for us to solve the three questions. So we can go ahead. Is it okay to share this? PDF or something, I mean, um, is it legal? <laughs> I think probably that slice of it is, is legal. Okay, then. <laughs> um, so let me, yeah, minimize that, okay. So the first question asks, which of the expressions below correspond to the statement probability of rain on Monday? So this is, this is basically probability of rain, given that uh, the day is Monday. So first, right off the bat, one is wrong. And it is asking probability of rain, so rain should be at the left of the pipe operator. So given that is Monday, so two is correct. And four is also correct because of the... Um, because of this, this rule. So if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to question three. <laughs> I two, sorry. All right, I think everyone's okay. Um, so question two is basically like, um, as, as we said, how can you read this loud? This question asks. So this is probability of Monday, given that it is raining. So that is three. And yeah, that's the only answer, uh, I think. No, no, no. Yeah. Given that it's raining. So three, if, is everyone okay with two? I'm okay with two. Okay. I'm going three. I'm reading three. Um, so this is asking basically how to write this sentence. And uh, to write this sentence, uh, as we explained, there is only, as you can see, there is no joint probability statement statements here. There's only uh, the conditional probability statements. So there are no commas, only pipes. So this signals me to that we're gonna use base theorem. And let's see, uh, probability that is Monday given that it's raining. So it's basically, uh, it is one, obviously. And let's look at the base theorem probability Monday is given raining is equal to probability that is raining given Monday times probability that is Monday divided by probability that is raining. So that is four. And that's it. <laughs> so. All right, those are also the same answers I got. Does anyone have any Questions, comments, disputes? I have a little bit of a, a difficulty at grasping the difference between the joint probability, so uh, P of uh, uh, rain comma Monday, for example, and P of rain given that it's Monday. I don't fully grasp the difference between these two statements. 
I, I think, yeah, I experienced the same thing also. And I think the difference is, uh, I think I grasped the difference when I did this example myself personally, because on given that you feel to use, I'm speaking in terms of R, you take, uh, you are only looking looking for one condition, like on given that it's raining. But when you use comma, you use you do you say that it's whether it's rain and it day is Monday. So that's my personal uh, grasp. So. I don't know if it's helpful to you. Yeah, I mean, um, the fact that, uh, the, sorry, yeah. Oh, no, I was, uh, I'll, just be, I'll be brief. Um, the one example that helps me, or that helps me think about it a little more clearly than rain on Monday is if you think about um, the, instead of the two events being a day of the week and raining, it, you know, this is a very American or Western example, but uh, think about the probability of getting a gift, of receiving a gift, and the probability of the day being Christmas. Um, if you think about the joint probability, so with the, the comma separating those two, one thing that you know is that the maximum that that can be is one out of 365, right? Because for the joint probability to be true, it at least has to be Christmas. Right? So if I want to know the probability of me getting a gift and it being Christmas, that's uh, one out of 365 at a maximum, right? That's, but, but, in, but if I'm in a family where every Christmas I receive a gift, the probability of receiving a gift, given that it's Christmas, is one in that case. Um, because I'm, because in this, I'm stipulating that the family just always gives uh, Christmas presents on Christmas Day. So there's one where the joint probability has a maximum value of 100 or 1 over 365, and the, um, the conditional probability, uh, and there are two different conditional probabilities possible with those two events, but the one of the probability of getting a gift given that it's Christmas is 1. So I think that those numbers are so distinct that it, the example is a little bit clearer at least in my head yeah yeah it's a bit clearer now thank you okay let um i'm gonna stop uh if, if everyone's okay i'm gonna stop presenting so if you guys don't have any questions or any objections to my Solutions. Okay, no news is good news, so I'm stopping. All right. Well, I believe that I'm next. Um, so I'll go and I'll try to go, I'll try to go pretty quickly. Um, all right, so this is a bit of a misleading. These are not the solutions for all of chapter two's problems. Um, all right, so uh, this is just from the book. Um, so hopefully, uh, I don't, I assume that he talks about this in the lecture. I actually admit I haven't watched uh, the lecture for this. I just read the chapter. Um, okay, so in the book, he talks about a globe tossing model. Um, so it's to, let's see, uh, just, in, just in case you haven't read it or watched the lecture, uh, it's simulating, I guess, trying to figure out how much of the world of the, of the earth is covered in water versus is covered in land. Um, 
And so the idea is that you, you throw a, a globe up into the, you just throw it and it spins, kind of randomization, and then you catch it. And wherever your right index finger is, that's where uh, are you, you write down water or land. So you see here in this uh, series of three trials, he threw it, got water. He threw it again, got water. And he threw it again and got water. OK. And so the idea, like this sort of learning objective here, is um, to start creating uh, grid approximations in R. Um, and so we're going to do it with three different experiments. We have one where we got water, 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 one where we got water, 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 land, and then one where it's land, water, water, land, water, water, water. Okay. Um, let's see. So again, this is what I was saying earlier. It's a proportion of water on Earth. And it's a nice variation, if you think about it, just on the uh, flipping a coin and the probability of getting heads, which is usually what appears in uh, stats books. And yeah, and if you want to look at that in the book, it's uh, section 2.4.3. Okay, so this is my summary of what goes on when you do grid approximation. Um, you initialize a grid, assign priors, get the likelihood for each grid point, you multiply the priors by the likelihoods, and you standardize the results from four to get the posterior. And if, well, I'll, I'll go over those things right now. So, so, um, so for step, so steps one through four can actually be condensed into steps one and three for this particular one, because we have flat priors. Um, which means that they're, you can basically set them at one. And given that um, what you care about are the relative plausibilities, if you multiply everything by the same number, that doesn't change any particular theorized parameters uh, relative plausibility. So I just skipped that. Um, and so after I did the grid, which is um, just uh, from zero to, to one, is what this line of code creates. Um, I do exactly what he does in the book, which is this vectorized likelihood calculation. Um, and so what this means, uh, just for those of you who haven't seen it before, is it calculates the likelihood of seeing three waters out of three trials. Uh, for each candidate um, parameter value. And so I just call that likelihood. I don't know exactly why I put the H. Oh, I guess hood. Yeah, likelihood for, for one. Uh, and there's no multiplication necessary, which just to go back was the fourth step because all the priors were, were one. So multiplying by one, you know, that's the multiplicative identity. So no need to do that. Um, and then step five with plotting is just normalizing the all the likelihoods, all the individual likelihoods um, by the, the sum so that this quantity, the, the posterior sums to one and you get this. So this is the distribution of, you know, plausible parameter plausibility after seeing, seeing WWW on a uniform prior. And you'll notice uh, that it peaks at one. So this went from being a flat line of all equal, equally plausible parameter values to one being uh, the most plausible. And I can actually now just go through the other two pretty much at the same time. Um, I don't need to do anything to the priors and I still need to multiply. So here I just need to get the likelihood for a situation where you get uh, one land in addition to the four waters. That's likelihood two and normalization. And then here, uh, five waters out of seven trials. So I do that. And then just to put them all in one, one slide, these are the resultant posterior distributions. You get for the um, proportion of 
of water covering the globe. So you see that they are slightly different, but uh, especially the last two are, are pretty similar. But they no longer peak at, at, at one. And in fact, you notice that one goes to zero because given that in both cases, land has been observed, uh, there's a 0% chance that uh, the earth is completely covered in water. So that's grid approximation uh, with, with flat priors. And in the second example, he has us assume um, that was kind of a stepwise prior. So it's going to be zero for p being less than 0.5. And then in this particular example, that means uh, that there's a 0% chance that less than half of the Earth is covered in water. Okay? And it's a positive constant when p is um, greater than half, greater than 0.5. So if you think about what sort of knowledge or previous information that's encoding, that's the idea that you know for 100% certainty that more than half of the Earth is covered in water, but beyond that, you don't know anything. So that's what that's what we're doing, sort of in a more practical sense here. And this is gonna be super quick. Um, I just need to encode the prior as um, so it's zero for the first 50 elements of my grid. And then an I put two is my positive constant uh, for the last uh, 51 entries in my grid. And so this is step two of the, of the uh, grid approximation. I suppose it's kind of an algorithm. Um, and then uh, step four, these are all step four, but for the different likelihoods. And there's a normalization. And what you end up getting is these fun little, uh, fun little plots where you'll notice that um, because of the prior, there's absolutely zero posterior mass at a values, the parameter values less than 0.5. And um, the shape is actually the same, interestingly. Um, I think that's maybe if I were trying to reverse engineer what McElrath was having us like figure out. For one, I, I guess one thing is that, you know, there's no mass below 0.5, thanks to our prior, and that the shape is the same. But if I were to put these, if I were to have had the forethought to uh, put these on the same slide as the previous ones, you'd see that the peaks kind of go higher uh, on the, the mass that does, that is non-zero. All right, and I don't want to belabor that much more because um, we've got other people presenting this same um, problem. But does anyone have any questions, I guess, about the setup of this uh, before I hand it off to whoever has section three or part three of this problem? Um, is the reason peaks going higher when there's a prior it's because the distribution is more tight. There's really less room to have variance. Yeah, the way I would think about it is that when you had um, these, you notice that, you know, so like the, if you were to take, um, and, you know, to go to do some calculus ideas, if you were to take an integral of this, it, it always has to equal one because of probabilities always have to sum to one. And so it's just kind of like, I don't know, if you have um, like a, a mattress, you know, and it has some fixed amount of air in it. So we're gonna assume that air can't escape and you push down on one part of it, right? And some other part has to kind of inflate a bit more. So that's, that's what's going on here. You can just imagine that someone has some device that perfectly pushes down, pushes all the air out from zero to 0.5 and pushes it into the rest. And so that's, that's how that goes. Okay, any other questions? No? All right, I will hand it off to the next person. And that will be me. Oops. Okay. So I'm 
um, working on the medium three, four, and heart one. So for um, this one, so we, so we are basically tossing two groups. So instead of only Earth, we also have Mars. And um, well, uh, for the Earth globe, 70% of its surface is covered in water. Whereas for Mars, at least until now, we thought that it's uh, fully covered uh, with land. And the idea is that um, we're tossing the globe, but we don't know what globe it is. And once we uh, point a finger and then we know, okay, it's a land. So what is actually the probability that the globe that we are, um, that we have there is of? And from the question, so we know that the, the probability of land given that it is an earth globe is 0 0.3. So just subtracting one the, with the proportion of water and the probability of land given that it's Mars is one. And because we have one globe for earth and one globe for Mars, the probability of getting either of the two is equal. So we assign 0 0.5 to both of them. And what we need to know is probability of Earth, given that we have um, a data point of land. And we can calculate it with a uh, base theorem. So um, probability of Earth given land, and we can calculate it by multiplying the probability of land given Earth, and then with um, probability of Earth divided by probability of land. But as you can see here, we don't know about the probability of land. And to calculate that, uh, we can do, so I, so I just think of it as a weighted sum of the probability of uh, land for both um, Earth and Mars. So we have um, probability of land given Earth here. So just plug the number 0 0.3 and here 0 0.5. And then we have a one here because Mars is fully covered with land and probability of Mars here. So because I'm too lazy to calculate it by, by hand, just plug it in R and we have 0 0.65. And afterwards we can plug the numbers that we have here into the base theorem equation over here. And we have, um, so land given Earth, it's 0 0.3. Probability of Earth, it's 0 0.5. And probability of land is 0 0.65. And from this calculation, we get 0 0.23 as the answer for this question. Okay, so any um, questions so far? All right, so I'll continue with the next one. So the for the fourth uh, question four, I have, well, a visual approach to it. So the idea is we have a deck of cards containing three cards and um, the side of the cards can have different colors, so either black or white. So we have one card that are that is covered uh, in black on both sides, so BB black black, and one card, uh, one side is black and the other is white. And another card we have um, white and white. So the question is that if we um, put the cards in a, a box or a bag, something. And then we just randomly take one of the cards and we put the card on the table. And then we see that um, the surface of the card that we're seeing is colored black. And then the question is, what's the probability that if we flip the card, then we are seeing black as well. So, so first we draw the card 
and out of um, well so there are three possibilities that we can um, get um, um, a black card so two from this because either of the side is covered in black and one from this so let's imagine that um, we can get either this card or this card and then of course only this card this card over here if we flip it then we will also see black and i guess we should be careful here that the probability is conditional on the first on the first row or the first look of the card so so we have two possible paths here so uh, black and black and then we just divide it over the first uh, draw or you know or the first surface so we have two divided by three and so we have um two over three for the probability of getting a black card and then we flip it we get a black card as well Should I proceed or does anyone have any questions? I'm really impressed with your diagram. Oh, PowerPoint. Good job. All right. Okay. And the next one I think is a bit challenging. Oh, I need to move the camera somewhere. Okay, I need to enlarge this. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess it's difficult to display both the question I, and- I do, yeah. I do have one question. Should we move, yeah. should we go first to the, oh. the rest of the medium problem? So there are some more- Oh yeah, so you're Tony right. Oh yeah, sign up. sorry, uh, too yeah. excited. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll start, uh, let me see. Um, Okay, yeah. Uh, well, I do not have that pretty diagram, um, but mine is, I have three questions here and they're all basically a continuation of that fourth medium question. Uh, so this one's again, you have those three cards, but this time we're adding another black black card. And the question is if you draw the first one card and it, Black side appears face up, calculate the probability of the other side being black. Um, so I didn't actually use the counting method for this. I mean, I guess they're all inherently you're using a counting method, but I try to type this up with code and think of it in terms of Bayes theorem. So I, I assigned a value of one to, to black and zero to white. And basically it's some variables for the black black card, the black white card, and the white white card and created a vector of length four for the likelihoods. And so we have two of the black black card counts uh, in that vector, uh, prior of one for each of these, and then basically applying Bayes theorem and looking at the sum of the probabilities of the two black cards. So in the vector is the first and fourth uh, um, elements of that vector. And I think both of those came out with you know, 0.4, and I think the black-white card had a 0.2 probability, and so summing up the 2.4s, I got 0.8. Uh, so I, that, I think that's right. <laughs> I Admittedly, this is probably easier doing the counting method. I just kind of approach it this way. Um, so um, if anyone has any objections to that, let me know. Otherwise, I'll continue. Uh, excuse me, just a request, a question. What, what, uh, this is our uh, probabilities. The, the likelihood is a vector of probabilities. Mm -hmm. Is it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's actually a vector of counts here. Uh, ah, okay. So it, yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, not, not a probability. Uh, because and... otherwise you have a two here, no? It's this N underscore B. Yeah. Yeah. It's one plus one is two, so 
Uh, yeah, so yeah, NBB is two actually. I, I should have, I guess, printed these out. NBW is one and NWW is zero. And then so you get two, one, zero, two in the vector. And then multiply all that by one, which is just itself, and then divide it by the sum of two, one, and two uh, being five. So that's how you end up with two divided by five is 0.4, and you get two of those. And overall, the posterior probability is 0.8. So I guess it doesn't become a probability until you divide it, you normalize here uh, by the sum of all the counts. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, you, you actually calculate four probabilities, not just one, right? Because it's a vector, so. Yeah, that was the uh, that was my confusion. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I realized this after looking back at it. I was like, this is probably not the most intuitive way to explain it, but this is, I guess, just my approach to it. Um, and in fact, that on the third part here, I'll get to in a second. I ended up just using the counting approach. Um, anyways, I'll go on to the next part, which is now we're back to three cards. So taking out that black, the second black black card. Uh, but this time, I guess the main difference here uh, is that, that they describe um, that there's two ways to pull the black white card. And again, we pulled a, a black face card to begin with. Um, but now the, the way they state the question here, you're essentially changing your, your prior. So uh, they tell you, okay, for every time you pull a black black card, it's your you're actually twice as likely to pull the black white card and actually three times as likely to pull the white white card. So uh, the, the setup I had before with the counts, the n underscore b underscore w, all that's actually the same. The, the, the first five lines here are the same. The likelihood's the same except for taking out that fourth card since we're back to three cards. Uh, it's just the prior that changes. And I, this is more representative of a, of a ratio, I guess, instead of counts, since it's, they're telling us it's the likelihood, relative likelihood. Um, so yeah, I take uh, three elements uh, vector here, and it's the same process of multiplying the likelihood and prior, that's, so that's a numerator in the, in the Bayesian formula, and then dividing by the sum of the posterior. Um, and then I end up with, yeah, probability of 0.5. So I can confirm <laughs> this time, I, I think I'm right because that's the answer that they say you should have had. Um, so yeah, yeah, this is definitely a different approach. Again, just thinking of it in terms of counts and not thinking of it un uh, until uh, of it as a probability until like a last step. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, I am gonna go to the third part. Uh, so this time, it's again the same card problem. Uh, you select a single card with the black side face up. Uh, before looking at the other side, you draw another card and lay it face up on the table. Um, that face is, is shown to be white. So it asks you to show the probability uh, that the first card, the one showing a black side, has black on its other side, uh, being uh, having a probability of 0.75. Um, so yeah. I couldn't think of a way to use the same framework uh, that I had done in the first two parts with the code to do it. So I literally just tried to think of all the possibilities here. Um, and I use some notation here. We don't really have to get into it. I, I came up with like eight different ways that you can draw, uh, have, um, actually, this, this is wrong. This should be the, the first card being black and the second card being white. I came up with like eight ways to do that. And only six of them involve that black black card. The other two of them involve the black white card. Um, and so that's so you're taking six out of eight. Um, that's 0.75, and that matches like the probability that they said uh, we should come up with. So I <laughs> I took it and thought, okay, I must have been doing something right. Um, but I should have had a diagram for this. I just was lazy and just try to use notation, but the notation is confusing. Just, um, I guess, take my word for it that there's, I think, eight ways to uh, draw a black card first and then a second, the second card having a, a white face.
All right, that was great. I'm definitely gonna have to stare at that for a little bit later. But uh, I mean, you did get the right answers. So I feel like the proof is in the pudding. All right, we've got, um, well, does anyone have any questions about those? All right, we've got some decision points coming up. Um, we've got 15 minutes, which I don't know if that's enough uh, to cover all of the hard ones. And we also have a double sign up that happened for the first part of um, hard one. So I don't know if we want to have like a trial by combat for that one, or I don't know, Ken and Mikael both uh, signed up for that. Um, I'm not sure how that happened. Mikhail's presentation is a lot cleaner than mine. Mine is, I'm not, I'm not as fancy as all, all the rest of you. So maybe we should start with him on number one and then I'll, but on the other hand, I actually found it easier to do number two first and then number one follows from that. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm, yeah, that I'm was something. To, Oh, no, that was something that I experienced as well. Um, so maybe I should just take it then. Um, yeah, sure. Sure, okay. That seems to be agreed upon. Okay, just a sec. Uh, let's see. I say I'm, I'm not as fancy as the rest of you. Um, the problem, and there are two species of panda bear. Both are equally common and live the same way. There's basically no way to tell them apart. But we know that species A gives birth to twins 10% of the time, and species B gives birth to twins 20% of the time. Um, so now you have a new program. You have a new female panda who gave, just gave birth to twins. You want to know what's the probability that the next birth will be twins. And also you wanna know the probability that the panda that you have is from species A. So I had to editorialize a little bit because if you can't tell these pandas apart, then I don't know how they're so, so, so certain that um, the species A gives, gives twins half as often as species B, but whatever. Oh wait, I'm sorry, I didn't click the share button. Somebody should have said something. Now, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so this is a problem. Basically, there's a lot of text, but really the facts are pretty simple. The probability of twins given species A is 0.1. Probability of twins giving species B is 0.2. We wanna know the probability was, and then the prior probability of each species is 0.5. We don't have, they're equally likely. We don't know a priori whether the panda is species A or species B. Now for Bayes' theorem, we need the average likelihood of probability of twins in general, which um, somebody did before in a similar context. It's the probability of twins given species A times the probability of A plus the probability of twins given B and times the probability of B and just plugging in the numbers. That gives us the probability of twins overall is 0.15. And I like to just sort of think about this intuitively as well, if that makes sense, it's halfway between 0.1 and 0.2. And since we have equally likely species A or species B, it makes sense that the probability of twins is just halfway between. So intuitively that makes sense. Now, um, so I did problem B first, which is trying to decide, given that the first birth was twins, what's the probability that the panda is from species A? So this is pretty straightforward Bayes' theorem. Probability of A given twins is the probability of twins given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of twins. Just plugging those in, the probability of twins given A is 0.1, probability of A is 0.5, probability of twins is 0.15 from here. So that gives a one third probability. And I just wrote it as a fraction because I don't know, I didn't want to round it. And I did the same thing for the probability of B, which comes out to two thirds, which makes sense because it's gotta be one or the other for one thing. 
And also, again, because it's twice as likely for a B to give a twin than an A, it makes intuitive sense to me that it's twice as likely that the mother of a twins is a B than an A. So um, that's the answer to hard question two. Um, so now we want to know um, the probability that the second one is a twin, given that the first one was a twin. And that sort of broke my brain for a little while. But um, what I realized is this is just changing now the, um, the prior. The prior for, uh, is this a mother of species A or species B, B is, the, is the posterior from this previous one. Um, because we already have it given that there was a child, a uh, birth of twins. So let's see. So the probability of the second, so this is now the joint probability. So it's the probability of twins given A times the probability of A given twins the first time around, plus the probability of twins given B times the probability of B given twins. So you can see this formula here is the same as this one, except with now the posterior from the first part plugged in as the, the prior for whether it's an A or a B. And then multiplying it out, it comes to 0.17. And again, I think this makes intuitive sense because we thought that the, the uh, mother was more likely to be a B um, by two to one. So the second one now is more likely to be a twin than, the, than what we had the first time around. The probability moves towards the probability of twins for B. Um, so that's the first two. I should probably take a breath here and see if there's any questions so far. This second one especially sort of broke my brain for a while until I realized oh, we're just plugging in the posterior from the first part as the prior for the second part. Okay, I will take silence as either other confusion, judging from the, some of the faces, or that I should continue. I'm not sure which. All right, well, I'll go on. So continuing on, suppose the same mother has a second birth and it's a single infant, not twins. So now what's the posterior probability of this panda species A? So again, I'm gonna take the posterior from up here, the probability of A given twins on the first birth and B given twins as the first birth and use those as the prior. So the probability, now my notation is a little, I didn't know how to write this exactly, but this is the probability of A given a single birth after a twin birth. And that's the probability of a single birth for an A times the probability, the like the um, prior probability of an A, which now is the probability of A given a twin divided by the probability of a single given a first twin. So now we need to figure out this average likelihood, which is, why is this? Oh, this is the same kind of thing I did here, but it's a probability of single given a first twin instead of the probability of a twin given a first twin. So this is the average likelihood. So it's probability of a single given an A times the probability of an A given a twin, probability of a single given B times the probability of B given a twin, which turns out to be 0.83. And now we plug those into Bayes' theorem and get that the probability of this is an, of an A given a single birth after a twin birth is 0.36. And again, I wanted to try to figure out how to do a reality check on this. So this should be smaller than the probability of A given just a single birth because the, the original twin birth pushed our prior probability towards B. And just putting those numbers into Bayes' theorem comes out as 0.53. Um, so that kind of checks out too. And I thought it was interesting to notice that um, the twin birth, because it's rare and because the difference in probabilities is two to one, that makes a big difference in the posterior. Whereas um, a single birth here um, makes very little difference a priori, the probability of A and B is 0.5. And if we see a single birth, the probability of A is just 0.53. It's barely moved because the probability of single birth is almost the same for A and B. But when we have a twin birth, the probability changes a lot. 
uh, because twin births are fairly rare and the probabilities are quite different. Um, and that's it. So I'll stop there and see if anybody has any questions or comments or did I do anything wrong? I just want to say that I appreciate you talking through the intuition behind some of the, the probabilities as well, because that, that that helped me. Like the math makes sense, but your added context also uh, yeah, helped me understand to, better. Yeah, trying to figure out. Okay, do, do I think this answer makes yeah. sense? Because it's so easy to to goof up on the formulas or the plugging the numbers in to just try to say, okay, do I actually believe this? Yeah, I think I do. And for me, to everything fall into place when you explained the last part to notice that part that's when i understood <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah the key thing for me was realizing that on the second birth that the the pri it's the prior probability of being an a or a b that is changed and we still can use just the plain old probability of single being an a but the pr then the, as the likelihood, but the prior for A is, is now different. And the probability overall of a, um, of a single is different. That was, that was really a key realization for, um, a couple, two, for two of these. All right, well, I'll, I'll stop then. We can let um, Stefano have a few minutes to do problem four. Okay, so I share. Uh, me too, I don't have a really fancy solution. It's mostly a knitted file. So it's uh, still in the context of the uh, species of pandas, uh, but this time we have a, a test, a genetic test, uh, which uh, is able to tell us to correctly identify species A with a probability of, uh, with a certainty of uh, 0.8 and uh, the, the probability it correctly identifies species B is uh, uh, 0.65. And so uh, uh, VET does a test and tells that the, the test is positive for species A. And so before we uh, take into account the uh, observation that we did on the birth of uh, pandas, we uh, we uh, want to, to see what is the probability that the panda is actually uh, of species A, given that the test was uh, 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 said that the panda was species A, which is something that maybe in uh, these times of testing uh, is uh, uh, weird uh, often. And so this is the formula that I used. So uh, as I said, I want to uh, compute the probability that the panda is actually A, given that the test said that the panda uh, is of species A. And so I, the formula says that I need to multiply the probability of a test uh, saying, uh, giving the A results, given that the panda is uh, of species A, and we know that it's uh, 0.8 multiplied by the species, the probability of uh, the panda being uh, of uh, species A which is the prior and it's 0.5 because uh, from the problem we know that each panda is uh, equally uh, distributed in the uh, in the territory and then we divide by the probability of a test giving the results uh, a and this is uh, a little bit where i have some doubts but i think that now uh, i know for, uh, here i wrote uh, whether I know that this is the average probability of uh, the test giving A. I was wondering whether this was a joint probability. Now I know that this is not a joint probability. Uh, and so uh, to compute this average probability of, uh, this is the only thing that uh, we need to compute in order to use the formula. And to compute it, we multiply the probability of the uh, test uh, saying that the panda is uh, of species A, given that the panda is uh, actually A, by the probability of panda being uh, uh, A in nature, plus the probability, uh, so I computed this, this from uh, this one. Uh, 
maybe writing, writing out the reason it would be would have been better but uh, so uh, another case in which uh, the the test can say a is when the the panda is actually b but the test says it's a and the the value of this probability is the opposite of this one so it this happens every time that the test is wrong when when our panda is uh, of species b and so uh, this is the probability times the uh, the probability of the the panda uh, being of species b which is uh, one minus uh, that of uh, species a but actually this is uh, 0.5 so it's uh, it's the same and then i plug this value uh, in in this formula so i multiply 0 0.8 uh, uh, with 0 0.5 divided by this value which i forgot to to plot and uh, so the posterior probability of our pandan being uh, of species a given that the test uh, say that it, it's a is around uh, 0 0.7 and this is the first part of the problem the second part of the problem says to use the, the birth data that we had from the previous exercises. And so uh, we now know uh, also that the panda gave birth first to uh, twins and then to a single child. And uh, so I have new starting information. The, the probability of twins with A and with uh, species B are still the same. What changed is now my prior probability of uh, panda uh, being of species A because uh, now uh, I know that panda are equally distributed but my test told me uh, I have now a higher probability of this panda being of uh, species A and so now I can use uh, the uh, I want to compute the probability of uh, uh, observing the the birth that I that we observed uh, if the panda is actually of species A. And so uh, we multiply the, the probability of a panda uh, uh, giving birth to twin times the probability of uh, the, the panda not giving birth to twins, which is the, the probability of uh, ob observing this sequence. And uh, it's 0.9. Then we compute the uh, probability of observing this uh, sequence if the panda is B, and it's the, the same calculation with the other value. And so this is the other probability. Then we compute the uh, average probability of observing this, uh, this sequence, which is the two that I just computed times each new prior. And so uh, 0 0.9, uh, 0, uh, 0 0.09 times the new prior which is uh, uh, 0 0.7 and uh, point, uh, 0 0.16 times 1 minus the, the new prior so uh, more or less uh, 0.3 uh, this average probability uh, has this value and now I have uh, everything that I need to uh, use the, the bias formula so the, the probability of the panda being uh, uh, of species A, given that we observed uh, this um, this uh, sequence of births, uh, is the probability of observing this sequence of births, uh, given that the panda is of species A, times the new prior probability uh, with uh, also using the information about the test. Uh, and all normalized by the probability of observing the this sequence of births uh, across all species of all uh, possible uh, uh, panda, let's say. And so this is the final prob posterior probability of uh, our panda being of species A, given that uh, we observed uh, uh, a positive uh, test result for panda being A and uh, the, the sequence of uh, uh, between uh, birth and a single uh, child birth. And this should be it. Wow, that's amazing. I did it a very different way and got the same answer. How did you do it? Well, unfortunately, I, well, uh, I just 
I interpreted the problem a little bit differently. I interpret it as just using the prior from part three, or sorry, using the result from part three as the prior for that problem instead of the other way around where you used the from, well, anyway, we didn't say different ways, but what I wanted to say is that I, well, we've gone over time. I think a few people have already had to drop out uh, of this meeting. And I think that uh, there's this like a very, there's a finite amount of Zoom time that uh, R for data science has. So I think I'm gonna have to, to wrap this up. Um, but uh, everyone did super brilliant. I just wanna say, Teshakur Ederim and grazie to our uh, to our presenters today. And um, I'm gonna put some um, comments in the, the stack, our stack, uh, Slack. Um, Mikael, do you have any anything you wanna add before I end this meeting so John doesn't yell at us? Uh, well, maybe um, you can post your um... Uh, files or answers to the Slack channel so that I can um, uh, collect all of them into the repo. Yes. Yeah, that, that was the exact thing I was going to ask. And we'll do chapter three next week. Chapter That's three the problems. Plans. That's the plan. Um, next yeah. week, we, in theory, we will also be able to do the problems that um, he has started uploading, he being the author, started uploading for like the special session. So we'll have to figure out how to navigate those additional the homework. Problems. Yeah. But anyway, we can figure that out in Slack. I think for now it's best if we, we sign off.